It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you with information that empowers you to make better financial decisions in your life. In today's show, Airbnb's legal battle going on with states, local governments, homeowners associations, how that affects you as a landlord, how that affects you as a customer. We're going to talk about that. And later, we're going to talk about lab-created diamonds that are taking over the jewelry business. So there are cases going on around the country about what are the powers of homeowners associations, what are the powers that they have to retroactively change the rules or to restrict rentals that are short-term at their properties. The general tone of what's happening around the country is a homeowner association can change the rules with a vote of the membership and a place where prior you were able to rent out short-term through Airbnb or VRBO or whatever, that, that you lose that ability to do so. In some cases, depending on state law, and this is what the courts keep hearing, existing owners are able to continue the short-term rentals. New owners cannot. And then through attrition, as people sell off, you no longer have the short-term rentals. So why is it that homeowners associations generally and condo associations are so hostile to Airbnb or the smaller VRBO. It's really simple. You take a community where people are aware of each other, know each other, and you end up transient like a hotel. There are a lot of people who buy a place just as an investor, no intention of ever living there, just to rent it out with a business model and business plan that shows you can make a lot of money. Well, the tide in the country has turned against short-term rentals. And it's funny because many of the people who use Airbnb at the same time would be horrified if there were Airbnbs next door or in a high-rise or in a complex or whatever. They don't want it in their own neighborhood, but they really like using it where they go because it affects quality of life for people in a neighborhood. And with middle-class housing, heavily affects availability of housing for people who want to live there full-time because of the short-term rentals. Now, you may disagree with what I just said, but the reality is the restrictions are getting tighter and tighter. So I got things to tell you for you who might be interested in buying a place and having it as a short-term rental to generate income. And for you going on vacation when you're looking for a place as an alternative to a hotel. So first for you as a would-be landlord, know that the restrictions that are being imposed by local governments or by homeowner associations may make the business model no longer work, particularly if it's a local government that bans effectively short-term rentals like New York City did recently. So you buy a place, you have the obligation for it, the math works great if you're able to do it as a short-term rental, Airbnb or whatever, and then the law changes, and you can't rent it anymore, and the numbers don't work. You can't make money with a long-term tenant because you make so much more renting it out short-term. I will tell you, my advice is never buy a place with the intention of turning it into a short-term rental if you can't also have a business case where you'll at least break even 
if short-term rentals are banned, and you have to instead engage a long-term tenant. There's been such a backlash against this in condominium communities that now a number of condominium communities around the country are banning even long-term rentals and only allowing units to be owner-occupied, period, because there's been such a backlash against the transient nature of the short-term rentals. Now, for you as a potential guest renting an Airbnb, in communities where they have effectively been banned or driven underground, you have a much greater chance of fraud. The New York example, now that New York City has banned uh, Airbnb from the city except in extremely limited circumstances that uh, I read recently that no one is qualifying for essentially, that people cannot meet the new rules. The rentals are being uh, driven underground on message boards, on Craigslist, things like that. And now you're in a whole new wild territory because you could show up having paid through Craigslist or whatever, and you got to fraud it. There is no rental there. Uh, there's, it's not owned by whoever purported to own whatever was there. And you're just flat out out your money. In New York, it had the effect that hotels wanted. Hotel occupancies have skyrocketed in New York since Airbnbs were banned. And the nightly rates are the highest they've ever been in New York. So Airbnb has clearly made a difference in the marketplace by being a shadow inventory competing with hotels. But now, if you want to do that in New York or other cities that have banned Airbnbs, it's a really scary buyer beware situation. Krista? Margaret in Texas says, I'm drowning in unsolicited nonprofit mailings. I could wrap the earth in address labels. I don't like to toss the quote unquote gifts out, but I can't afford to send them money. How do I get removed from these mailing lists? So the things I talk about with mailing lists apply to for profit organizations, the mail preference service, where you can stop unsolicited mail. Charities do not participate in this. I'm guessing, and this is a guess only, a lot of the solicitations you're getting are from maybe not the greatest charities. Maybe they are legally charities, but not ones that spend money efficiently. They do these very high cost mailings, and the amount of money spent on direct service tends to be lower. And you must have at some point have given, even if it's small amounts, to a number of these very aggressive marketers for nonprofits. And then you get on lists that generate a lot more. The only way you can reduce it is, this sounds hard hearted and cold, don't give money in those solicitations. If you ever decide to give money to a charity, don't ever give it in response to a solicitation. Go to their website and donate right there. And then the source of what generated your response is not through that direct mail marketing. Do not feel any obligation if a charity puts a dime in an envelope or a free stamp or uh, a mail, you know, return address labels to you or whatever. That is a psychological game to try to get you to give something and use guilt is a way to get you to give. You give to who you want to give to. I can tell Margaret you're a generous person. The mailing lists are driving you crazy. And maybe at some point, charitable organizations will join uh, something like the mail preference service and give you the ability to stop that from coming. Because the key is if you never give, respond to any of those, eventually you're not as much a target. 
James in Florida says, is now the best time to buy a house if you're a cash buyer? I see home sales are falling in part due to high interest rates, but should I feel pressure to buy a house in the next 12 months if I have the cash? I'm looking to upgrade my small condo, but I'm content for now to get over 5% interest on my cash in online banks. So James, um, there are only a small number of markets in the United States where home values are actually falling. We're seeing some of that now in parts of Florida, and not because of the very high, by recent standards, mortgage rates at 7 or 8%. We're seeing it because people are being priced out of middle-class housing in coastal communities in Florida because of the homeowner's insurance problem. And so there is opportunity, potentially, for a cash buyer, but Florida had a big run-up in value pre-COVID to now, uh, bigger than most of the rest of the country. And so you're still at a very high price point. Uh, vacation destinations, second home destinations, and Florida fits both of those, tend to have bigger swings from peaks and values to valleys and values compared to the rest of the country. And so we've seen this pattern, like during the uh, banking scandals that led to the housing bust 15 years ago, uh, we saw very clear patterns in Arizona and also in Florida, which are such heavy vacation and second home states that they saw extreme peak to trough during the real estate bust. So I would say, Hold on to your cash, earn your 5%, give it some time, and then you'll be at the right moment later to buy. That's my expectation, at least. Ken in Florida says, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you for your advice. A few months ago, you answered my question about paying for seats on British Airways or waiting until they're free to select 24 hours before the flight. You suggested waiting. We did, and we were easily able to get seats for the three of us next to each other. We saved more than $300 by not giving in to their scare tactics. Thank you. London was great, and we had a good experience flying British Airways and would definitely fly with them again. And P.S., you were also right about not needing cash in London. We paid for everything with our phones and didn't think, don't think we pulled out our wallets at all. It is funny in Europe now that cash is not used really anywhere that everything is tap to pay or using plastic but mostly tap to pay and i'm so glad you didn't give british airways 300 wasted dollars on their seat assignment scam that they run just so you're aware there are several european airlines that anybody except the elite level frequent flyers it's not allowed to have a seat assignment without paying for it. So that means that when you check in 24 hours out, the seat map, if you check out exactly 24 hours out, the seat map's wide open. So there's no reason to pay for the seat fees. In the United States, if you fly uh, full fare airlines like American United and Delta, what happens is they have so many people that are frequent flyers and others who qualify to get seats in advance, and then the, the rest mere mortals, they're often pushing you to pay seat fees. If instead you start at the back of the plane, you can usually book a seat at no fee on American, United, and Delta when you book your reservation if you're willing to sit back towards the tail of the plane rather than the middle or the front. Coming up ahead... I'm going to talk about the extreme change going on in the jewelry business that can save you a fortune. Wow, do I have good news for you. You know, the Christmas season has become a big jewelry purchasing season. I mean, the jewelers, the retail stores, the wholesalers, they all want you so badly to use every occasion is an occasion to buy jewelry. And it used to be this was a quiet time and then Valentine's Day was a big time for jewelry and diamond sales. 
But now Christmas has become a big, big time in this industry. And there are changes taking place in the culture of the jewelry business that absolutely are your friend. So I was sitting at a red light and there was a billboard for a traditional local jeweler that I've known for a long time who was very, very uh, anti-lab diamonds. And I'm looking at the billboard and it's the normal billboard for this jeweler. And then at the bottom, it said lab created diamonds available or lab diamonds available or something like that. And the left turn arrow came on and I didn't even notice that the car behind me honked at me to go because I was staring at the billboard because I know this jeweler and I know how much they didn't like the whole idea of lab diamonds. They weren't traditional. And now Prada has introduced lab created diamonds. And you look and the, the sellers across the board, I mean De Beers has its own lab created diamond seller that they, you can't see the fingerprints of De Beers anywhere at Lightbox, but they're selling bigger and bigger and bigger stones of extreme quality where depending on the size diamond, generally you save 75% to 90% on a diamond buying lab created. I mean, you go back 18 months ago and the savings were much smaller, maybe 50%. But because lab-created diamonds are chemically identical to dug-out-of-the-earth diamonds, and the labs don't have a limited supply of what can be found and dug out of the earth in these dangerous mines, the supply of lab-created diamonds is growing exponentially. And what happens when you take something that's been a limited supply market and it grows by leaps and bounds, the volume of demand can't keep up with the volume of production, and the prices are going down, 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 down. If you are a traditionalist and you're interested in buying diamond-based jewelry, please at least have an open mind. If you're going to buy diamonds for this Christmas season or for Valentine's Day, or for an engagement ring, or just because for your sweetheart, whatever the reason, please look at these lab-created diamonds. In the secondary market, the value of lab-created diamonds, as we've had very angry jewelers point out to us, they don't hold value because they have a special marking you can see under a jeweler's loop that designates that even though it's chemically identical to a dug out of the earth diamond, that it was lab created. And so the marketplace gives it a lower value. But you're paying so much less for that lab created diamond and the quality that's available in the marketplace. I mean, it's, uh, as one of my brothers said, it's so cheap, it's stupid, <laughs> which means it's brilliant to look at these lab created diamonds. And yes, so jewelers who are traditionalists, if you're sore at me about this, please go to clark.com slash Clark Stinks. I'd love to have your perspective and response. All right, we'll go to questions now. BG in Nebraska says, cell phone plan question. My cell phone provider offers a plan with unlimited talk, text, and smartphone data. What is the difference between data versus smartphone data? Ah, this is a new distinction in the marketplace. What that means is that on your smartphone itself, you have unlimited data. But if you're using your smartphone as a hotspot, there is almost certainly some restrictions or data cap on how much data you get running your laptop. I'm, uh, you know, I travel, seems like every week of the year, and so I'm on my laptop all the time. So I'm on a uh, data plan that gives me unlimited smartphone data and unlimited hotspot data because that's something that I need as I travel. I don't use public Wi-Fi 
when I travel. I never use the hotel Wi-Fi, airport Wi-Fi, whatever. I run off my cell phone because that's much safer than running off a public Wi-Fi. So that's the distinction you have there, BG, is that you got unlimited smartphone. Your plan almost certainly has a tight cap on how much uh, hotspot data you have. Bree in Wisconsin says, a few weeks ago, Clark mentioned that the only way to beat Ticketmaster junk fees was not to go. I've hated Ticketmaster with a fiery passion for decades. I used to attend concerts regularly, but stopped going to those sold through this company. There is a potential... Wait, wait, wait. Put in the adjective. Oh, horrible company. Thank you. There is a potential workaround, though. Some venues have a box office and will sell you tickets in person, not online or via phone. I recently bought tickets at a local venue and was able to save 22 bucks in Ticketmaster junk fees. The ability to buy tickets is not available at every venue and may have limited hours, but it's worth a look. Thanks for all you do. Thank you so much, and that is my bad that I didn't mention that because there's a venue that my wife wants to go to things at sometimes, and I go and I pay $4 to park nearby at a meter, then I go stand in line, and I buy the tickets and avoid the entire Ticketmaster ripoff surcharges and fees and junk fees and fees on top of junk fees and all of that. And that is great advice. Michael in Georgia says, I own a 2014 Honda CRV with 186,000 miles. Wow. At the current moment, the vehicle does not have any issues and is in great shape considering the age and mileage. I wanted to know at this point, would you just recommend driving the vehicle until it dies? Or does it ever make sense to sell it while it's still worth some money and purchase another used vehicle with less miles? I work from home and my wife has a very short commute and we have another vehicle that is newer with low mileage. Just curious of your thoughts on this. My thought is it works right now. Why spend the money? But my wife is concerned with the high mileage. It may leave us stranded one day. So your wife is right that at some point, the CRV may leave you stranded one day, but you're also right that you should just keep driving it. The reality is the chances that you'll end up in a situation where it breaks down at night in a dangerous location is so low, and 186,000 on a CRV, I know that sounds like a lot of miles. It's not really. If you're doing regular basic maintenance on that Honda, it's got lots and lots and lots of years left to go. And I was talking to a proud owner of a Honda recently that's a 2004 mm. and has, I forgot how many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles, still running great and um, it's not looking so good, <laughs> but still running great 20 model years out. And so I, I think it's best to keep driving. It's pretty much fully depreciated out anyway. So the miles you're driving now are almost free. Hannah and Georgia says, my fiance is a big fan and through him, I am as well. We're getting married in the spring and booking our honeymoon. Is it more cost effective to use the resort to package the flights or to book our flights and resort stay separately? For some additional information, we're doing an all-inclusive Caribbean, Caribbean honeymoon around the Memorial Day weekend. All right. So first of all, yeah, congratulations, Hannah. And you're brilliant picking a wedding time after April 20th to do a Caribbean vacation because April 20th is kind of the line of demarcation that after that date, costs of both flights and resorts in the Caribbean go way down. So there is no automatic answer if you're better off buying a, an inclusive tour that includes air and the resort. The only way to know is to price it both ways. Now, you're really too far out to book a, a May Caribbean vacation. You know, you're not at a point that people are going to be hungry and they're going to be offering deals. So I think it makes sense to wait. A little while but go ahead and compare prices of doing each component separately and doing one of the packages if you do one of the packages even if you buy it from an airline that has a thing where they're selling you an inclusive tour those are all third-party operators paying basically a franchise fee to the airline 
to be their vacation seller. So you're paying an additional middle person markup with the package. So it would have to be a really good uh, discount built into both the airfare and the resort to make the package work. People like to buy packages because it's easy. You know, you just click here and you got your hotel, you got your transfers, you got the air flight, you got all those things. But if you're willing to price the components individually, usually that will be cheaper. Um, and on the thing of me telling you to wait, uh, that may be uncomfortable for you. If that does not make you comfortable and you're happy with the prices you see booking a Caribbean resort now for May, and you find, okay, it's better as a package, it's better individually, go ahead and do it. Um, what do you think about checking Costco Travel? Well, Costco Travel is a high volume, really good seller of packages. If you're a Costco member, you definitely want to check Costco Travel. But if you buy the components individually, the resort, do not book a non-refundable stay at the resort. Book a refundable stay where usually up to 21 days before travel, you can cancel, rebook, whatever, because then you have the benefit of knowing you have the resort, but being a free agent as well. If better prices come up somewhere else, no harm, no foul, you move somewhere else. If better prices come up at the resort you're intending to stay, no harm you're able to get the then lower rate. The one thing you don't want to do this far out is book non-refundable, non-changeable resorts. That is a, a trap that you want to avoid at all cost. And again, congratulations on your upcoming wedding. And now it's time for today's Clarky. Hi, this is Mike from St. Petersburg, Florida. Clark, what's the record? As usual, your advice is golden. Well, make that just silver. I'm on month 15 of my daily Gillette Pro Glide Fusion blade. It has five blades in it. No cuts, but the shave isn't the smoothest anymore. I don't think Gillette wants this out since uh, their sales would plummet. Um, can you tell me who the longest use that you've heard of is? so I know whether I should just continue or stop and let my beard grow. All right, so Thanks. let's let's think this through. So the longest I ever did was 14 months. And I remember when we did that on my then radio show where I where I showed um, you know pictures of being 14 months in with one blade. A producer for CBS News called and said, "You're kidding, aren't you?" And so they ended up doing a story of me. I had to pull the 14-month-old the blade out of mothballs and do it again on TV. And they made me shave with cold water because hot water made them, the, oh, they were doing the a reverse lens. shot through a mirror, made it steam up. Do you know how hard it was to shave with a 14-month-old mm. blade with cold water? Did you go to the emergency room after for stitches? <laughs> no, I was okay. I did not okay. nick or cut. They were waiting for me to nick and cut. I think they wanted that because, you know, on the news, if, if it, it bleeds, bleeds, it, it bleeds. bleeds. But, sorry. Um, <laughs> but you're 15 months. I think you should declare victory. And Gillette uh, hopefully will not have a contract out on your life. They don't want people to know that blades do not degrade from use. They degrade only from moisture. And if you properly dry a blade after each use, you can get month after month after month after month out of one individual blade. So good for you. 15 months in, men and women, stop fooling your wallet and spending all that money. Because I didn't want to say you were fooling yourselves. And stop making Gillette's stockholders rich. It's your money. Don't let them con you into having to have a new blade every blink because they will last 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 with simple steps after each shave and thank you for sharing that you now have beaten me at 15 months what's the world record for a blade 
don't know. And I hope you have a great day. Remember what we're about. Save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off.